Thanks to today, we have Abhinav, and so he will be talking about the T50 perspective on factor uh, order. Thanks. Thanks, Lash and Al Lorenz, for the invitation to talk here. So, yeah, and you both have starting start with IS. So I'll take this opportunity to tell you all about something that I've been thinking about for the last few years, and hopefully can make some more progress on this problem uh, while at IS. So, I'm a condensed matter theorist. And one of the broad sort of aims of condensed matter theory over the last 10, 20 years has been the classification of different objects of matter. This is, of course, a problem that's so broad that in some sense it's meaningless, but we can make uh, progress on a narrower aim, which is classifying sort of all the quantum phases of gap local Hamiltonians. So what do I mean by local here? I just mean I have some Hamiltonian, which is a sum of local terms. So, um, in condensed, condensed matter, I'm usually imagining that we have some lattice, and on each lattice site, we have some finite dimensional Hilbert space, and uh, the Hamiltonian decomposes into a sum of local terms where each term, each of these HKs, for example, uh, is only acting on a finite range. And then what do I mean by translation on invariance? Uh, it could or could not be translation invariant. Yeah, everything I say today will be translation invariant, but in general, Topological phases, of course, can be defined in the absence of translation. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, please interrupt me with any questions. Uh, okay, so, what do I mean by gap in this case? Of course, I mean my system, as there's some, uh, I have some ground state, and then there's a gap to the next uh, excited state. And when I say that the system is gapped, it means this difference between the energy levels should stay finite even in thermodynamic. So, that's what I think would be the definition of a gap. Case. I should mention, mention that there are also gapless phases that people consider, but today we'll just discuss uh, gap phases. Okay. So the general understanding is that the low energy physics of such systems, systems with a gap to excitations, should be described by uh, some kind of a topological quantum field theory, and so we call these topological phases. So what is a topologically ordered state of matter? So these are uh, um, phases that are beyond Landau's paradigm of symmetry breaking. There's no local order parameter. Um, they display a pattern of long range entanglement in the ground state. Uh, typically, these uh, systems have some fractionalized anionic excitations, which have non-trivial beta braiding and fusion. And if you take these kinds of systems, let's say in two plus one dimensions, and you put them on the torus so with periodic boundary conditions, a uh, system with non-trivial topological uh, order will have uh, a ground state degeneracy. And this in principle, this should only depend on the, uh, the topology of the manifold on which you put this. So we have experimentally uh, realistic um, examples of these, of course, most famous of which is the fractional quantum Hall effect, which was discovered uh, in the 80s. And indeed, for this, you can measure the uh, charge conductance, for example, and you can see that excitations in the system have charge E over three instead of the, uh, just the fundamental electric charge. And there are also spin liquids, and uh, in, in some cases, superconductors can be thought of as topologically ordered phases. So as I said, uh, topologically ordered phase is a, uh, is, a, oops, is, a, is a system where um, we can describe the low energy physics through some kind of a DQFT, and DQFTs are essentially QFTs where the amplitudes only depend on the topology of the processes that are let me give a definition of topological order, just so we're all on the same page. So I'll be considering local Hamiltonians with some bulk gap and of correlation length, with the bulk gap remaining finite in the thermodynamic limit, and all correlations also remaining finite in the thermodynamic limit. And then the number of states that I have below this uh, en finite energy gap Will, uh, will be some finite number and it will depend only on the topology of the manifold that we're considering. Okay, so that's, I think, one definition of DQFT stops here, but in condensed matter, we also want to consider uh, the situation where there's no local operator which can distinguish between this manifold of ground states. So I can have all these different ground states, let's say M and N, and there's no local operator which can distinguish between these up to uh, corrections uh, that depend, that vanish on the thermodynamic limit. So that's sort of an operational definition of what a topologically ordered phase is. Okay, so how do we classify different phases of matter based on this uh, in terms of topology? So this is done through adiabatic continuity. So suppose I have two Hamiltonians with two different ground states, H1 and H2. And if there's a path in the space of Hamiltonians that take me from H1 to H2, 
and the gap never closes through this path, we say these two Hamiltonians are adiabatically connected. So they so equivalently uh, the ground state is in the same phase throughout. So it's just the same statement. Um, so now let's say, suppose I consider uh, fermions in two plus one dimensions or two spatial dimensions. And I look at the space of all local gap Hamiltonians, we have a general understanding of how these are classified in terms of their topology. And I can label all of these, for example, in terms of these different circles. So each of these is a different topological order. So there's trivial topological order, there's new equal one uh, integer quantum homologies, an invertible topological space. You can have more exotic things like new equals five halves, which corresponds to the Eisen topological order, and so on and so forth. And the point is that all local gap Hamiltonians that sit inside one of these white circles are in the same phase. So I can deform those fixed point Hamiltonians into different Hamiltonians, but the phase remains the same. But to go from one to the other, I have to go through some topological phase transition. Okay. So that's new equal to minus one mean. Uh, it's just the the, the, the conjugate. So uh, yeah. So in in this phase, there's this trivial uh, phase. So all states that have trivial topological order are short range. We call them short range entangled, which means I can take the state and I can apply a finite depth uh, uh, quantum circuit and just decompose it into a pro trivial product state. So as follows, I have some ground state, which could have some kind of short range entanglement, but just through a finite depth local unitary, this can be transformed into a trivial product state. So these, so in terms of uh, this kind of space of trivial Hamiltonians, in the absence of any symmetry, all states are topologically equivalent to just a trivial product state. But this classification, of course, can be, uh, sorry. This was for the ground states. This is all for the ground state. That's right. This is all for the ground state. This classification, is this equal to the previous one? Uh, yeah, so so far I haven't imposed any symmetries. So this is the same. So in terms of, if I'm just asking about topological order, then the trivial, uh, kind of trivial topological order, all states are short range entangled, and everything that's not trivial would have some long range entanglement in the ground state. So, for instance, um, the uh, um, fractional quantum Hall wave function cannot be transformed into a trivial product state. But I meant was for the opportunity there is a classification where you also them equivalent with sure with this finite depth circuits, right? Uh, so, so there are two notions of uh, equivalence you discussed so far. I think one is whether we buy the Hamiltonian, right? Uh, no. no. They got nowhere closer, right? And the other is this one where we would say there's a finite uh, unitary circuit between the two phases. Yes, those are equivalent. Yeah. Obviously they're equivalent. So you have to use the Lee Robinson term. Uh, so for local gap Hamiltonians, those two notions are equivalent. But in general, if you allow for long range um, interactions, then it's not here. Okay. Just... This classification, right, uh, can be made a bit uh, finer if we start imposing symmetries. So if I take the space of short range entangled uh, ground states and I add some symmetry, global symmetry G, then I can break up this, what was previously kind of a trivial phase into different phases. And these are called symmetry protected topological phases. So in this case, if I wanted to st start with some ground state and turn it into a trivial product state, there are cases when you cannot do that without breaking the symmetry. And so that would be an example of a non-trivial SPP phase. So the only uh, circuit that would decompose your uh, short range entangled ground state into the trivial product state would have to break the symmetry. Uh, and so this is the definition of a, of a symmetry protected topological phase. But there are no, for SPT phases, there's no topological order, there are no fractional excitations, there's no long range entanglement, no ground state degeneracy on uh, non-trivial manifolds. In a sense, in some sense, the bulk is trivial and all the uh, interesting physics is on the boundary for these SPT phases. So the topological insulators that were discovered are, are, are an example of SPT phase. And then we can do the same thing. I could take Z2 gauge theory, for example, and impose some symmetries. And so in this case, you can break just the Z2 topological order phase into distinct symmetry enriched topological phases. And the way we distinguish these is that the anionic excitations in this case would carry different symmetry uh, fractionalization classes. Okay, so up to this point, 
um, things are fairly well understood, at least in two plus one dimensions. We think we have a, an almost complete classification of all different topological phases in terms of uh, unitary modular density categories, for example. Uh, and even in the presence of symmetries, we have very good understanding of how these different uh, phases are captured. And in three plus one D, we also have some understanding in terms of fixed point Hamiltonians, um, uh, that you're up with in uh, gauge theory, also these Walker Wong models, et cetera. But in 2011, Zhang Wan Ha wrote down this local gap Hamiltonian, which challenged all of the notions that we had for understanding gap phases at that point. So this goes by the name today of fracton order. And so these are, again, gap states in three spatial dimensions. These systems also have a ground state degeneracy on the three doors, and all these distinct ground states are locally indistinguishable. These systems also have uh, deconfined point like excitation, similar to anions in two dimensions. So, all these properties are properties that this system shares with just conventional PO. Um, but here's where sort of the strange properties of these systems come in. So, fraction ordered systems have excitations which cannot be moved by themselves. In other words, there's no string operator for separating excitations in these systems by themselves. So that's a defining feature of what I mean by a fracton model. And I'll give an example of this soon. Uh, they also have additional excitations, which can only move by themselves along um, subdimensional manifolds of the full 3D system. So you have excitations that can only move along lines, which people call lineons. You can have excitations that can only move along planes, which people call planons. And then the fractons are particles that by themselves are completely immobile. The other thing that is quite strange about these models, which is why people have been uh, interested and excited about them, is that the ground state degeneracy depends on the system size. So this is clearly something that we would consider is, in some sense, beyond what's allowed in a DQFD. In a DQFD, the ground state degeneracy should only depend on global properties. It should only depend on the topology of the manifold. But in these kinds of systems, the ground state degeneracy depends on the system size, for example. And this is a robust degeneracy. This is not something that you can break just by adding local dams to the Hamiltonian. Um, all of these ground states are really indistinguishable. And see, when you have a magnetic field sample, also when you have lambda levels, you also have some degeneracy. That's right. Uh, it depends on the size. Um, on the number of flux contacts in that case. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Imagine you adjust the chemical potentials of the, the, the lambda level, so you could either add or not add it in each lambda level. Right. So uh, you have the degeneracy, which is proportional to the volume, or the area, I mean. But that's not, uh, that's not a topological degeneracy in that case. In, in these systems, it's a so I can, for example, take all these different ground states and I can start adding whatever perturbations I want to add, and I cannot lift this degeneracy okay. until it goes through a phase transition. So it's not some symmetry breaking degeneracy. There's another difference. The, in one's case, it's the size of the system in the continuum, where here it's the number, the number of flag sites. Right, that's also correct. Yeah, so right. If you take the number of flight sites to infinity, the number of ones, the, the number, of, the, the ones the generous will not go to infinity, where it's this one where. Right, but it could be that the, maybe the lattice system already has something like a unit magnetic flux per, per site. But then you have to take the, the magnetic field also. To, right, that's true. Yeah, yeah. And if there are systems on lattices which already have like a flux. Right, no, yeah, yeah. The, the issue that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, the issue is separate, yeah. Yeah, I think the key distinction is that these are topological generacies, right? Not, not symmetry productive, as lifted by something else. Is it important that it's three plus one T, or do they also exist? Good, yeah. So, as far as we understand, these kinds of fracton models where the ground state degeneracy is topologically robust uh, only exist in three plus one D. So, there's a proof by Jean Wan for translation and variant stabilizer codes. That at least in those systems, fractons can only uh, exist in, in three plus one dimensions. Um, we have a generalized argument again for translation invariant systems that fractons should not exist in, in two plus one D. Um, but there's maybe one way of saying it is nobody's found the model so far in two plus one D. Yeah. That, if somebody does, that'd be very interesting. Uh, these things. There are models in two plus one D where you can have 
excitations with restricted mobility, um, but there the ground state degeneracy can be lifted by local terms. So really, I I should distinguish between topological fractons and, for example, symmetric protected fractons. So in the last maybe six, seven years, there's been uh, a lot of work in the condensed matter community on these fraction phases of matter, in part because they seem to have connections to all these different uh, areas of research. So they have, um, in fact, one of the first a fractal model, although it was recognized as such, was found by Shimon in 2005. He was looking for a topological quantum glass. Um, there's uh, connections between fractons, and there's a hope they use them for uh, quantum memories. And um, there was some idea that they could be used for quantum information storage and processing. Um, so there was. Is that no longer the case? So that was his original motivation. That was Hau's original motivation, yeah. but it turns out that Hau's code is not uh, uh, robust to finite temperatures. Yeah. So you really need you need to get rid of all point like excitations, and it's only a 4D toric when you first see my temperature. Um, these systems turn out to be dual to some conventional elasticity theories. Um, but the most interesting thing about these systems, in some sense, is this uh, the IR mixing. The fact that the long the the low energy properties of the system really seem to depend on on what's happening at the microscopic scale. And so it seems to challenge some of our understanding of, you know, TQFD or even QFD, for example, and that stuff. But not the has collaborators have been working on. Okay. So right, right, let, let me just fix some terminology. So if you run across a condensed matter paper with the word fracton, it doesn't necessarily mean they're talking about what I'm talking about today. Uh, today, fracton is sort of just a go to term for any excitations with restricted mobility. But today, I will only be talking. About these three plus one the gap fracton phases where there is some topological uh, topological degeneracy. Okay, so there's lots of lots and lots of open questions about fractons. So we don't even fully understand when two different fracton models are in the same phase. Um, we don't fully understand how to characterize these systems in terms of braiding and fusion the way we can for just regular topological order. Um, their entanglement properties are sort of still open. Um, Taking the continuum limit for these models is hard, and it's not known if there always is one. Um, and then the problem that I'll try to address today is, is there even some good unified framework within which we can fit all these fracton models? So in the literature right now, there's you know, at least 20, 30 different kinds of fracton models. And in, in some sense, we got very lucky with topological order. We have Hittite quantum double models, and we have 11 men string net models. And be between the two, we can see a lot of the uh, broad properties that topological or topological order systems share in common. And that allowed people to classify these. Here, one of the starting problems is that we have all these different kinds of models, and it's not clear what, what, which features are, are shared, which features are just specific to different models that we're considering. And as I mentioned, in, in because of this sensitivity to the geometry, fractons seem to appear beyond the QFD. But they also share some features in common with PQFD. For example, even though the number of ground states is dependent on the system size, they are topologically protected, right? So there's no local perturbation that can lift this degeneracy, which is in common with topological order. And the excitations in fracton models also have braiding and fusion, similarly to what they have in, in topologically ordered systems. So there's some connection between the two, which is what I'd like to focus on. So let me now give you talked a lot about fractons. Let me give you an example of a fracton model. So this is a very coarse terminology. So there's these so-called type one fracton models. These are systems in which these excitations are created at ends of membrane operators. So just to remind you, um, for example, in two plus one, the the classic model that we can consider is the Torf code Hamiltonian. Which I'll come back to later. So in two plus one, the code is uh, a model on the square lattice where degrees of freedom live on the link. So Z2 degree of freedom is a qubit per link. Um, and I'll come back to this later. But in this model, for example, we can create these, these excitations. For example, uh, I can create an excitation at a vertex, which we call a charge excitation. And they always come in pairs in this case. And these can be separated by a string operator, which I can deform freely. So I can always move these around. 
these type one fracton models, which was one day one, are systems where these excitations are always created at the ends of some membrane breaker. <laughs> And so then it should be clear why I can't move one of them by itself instead of change, uh, without creating some additional excitations. Okay, so let me give an example of this model. So this is the so-called X cube model. So this is defined on the uh, cubic lattice. There are spin degrees of freedom equivalently qubits on each link of the lattice. Um, the Hamiltonian is the sum of these two, two terms. So the BC term is a product of sigma X operators on the edges of the cube. It's a 12 spin interaction. The other term, the AV term, there's three of them. That's just the toric code term. So that's a, that's a product of sigma Zs on four, um, on four links. And there's three orientations for those. Okay, is that, you know, let's talk about those questions. Okay. Okay, so that's the model. That's the F2 model. So you can, it's clear to see just because they're Pauli operators that each term in the Hamiltonian commutes with all other terms. It's an exactly solvable model. And so I can label all the eigenstates of the system just in terms of uh, whatever its eigenvalue is under these different uh, projectors. So they have eigenvalue plus or minus one because they're Pauli stabilizers. And the ground state in this case is just the state that has eigenvalue plus one under each of these terms that lowers the energy. So that's this X cube model. It's a gap phase because if I wanted to change the eigenvalue of one of the terms in the Hamiltonian, I have to go from minus one to plus one. And so that's a finite number, even in the thermodynamic limits, it's a gap system. You can calculate the ground state degeneracy of this model. And it turns out to be, uh, so the ground state degeneracy is D. So it's two to the six L minus three. So it depends on how many sites I have on the lattice as value is and it changes if I change the system size. And this is a uh, this is a robust topological degeneracy. So I can add perturbations to my system. I can add local terms to the Hamiltonian, and you won't be able to lift this ground state degeneracy. And here is the side thing with the total number of sides. Oh, uh, so here I'm fixing Lx equals Ly. Yeah, it's a linear system. So the more general formula is two to the let me write it here. That's the general thing. Thanks. Yeah. And this minus three is important. Yeah. So let's say I start in the ground state. So the eigenvalue of each of the operators in my Hamiltonian is plus one. That's the ground state. And now I'll act with a sigma z operator which will flip, so let me go back. So the BC term, the cube term, is a product of sigma Xs. So we'll act with the other one, sigma Z, on one of the links. So that will change the eigenvalue of these four cube, cube terms. Right? So that creates four excitations in the cubes. And now I keep acting with these. So I'll act with another sigma Z operator that moves, flips those two cubes back to plus one and flips the other two to minus one. And I'll keep repeating this. And you see that at the end, if I want to separate these excitations, I have to act with this membrane operator as promised. And so <laughs> the original thing you started with, with the four cubes, right? That thing it can still be moved. That's right. Yeah, that's a local excitation. So anything that can be created locally can be moved. Yeah. But that's that, in some sense that's that would be in the trivial sector of the model, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. You can isolate the single cube. Uh, it has to be. That's right. Yeah. So, if you, for, for instance, if you end up in this configuration and you ask, can I move the cube? Let's say, uh, okay. If can you move this cube, for example, by itself, there's no way you'll create three additional cube excitations. So, there's no way to move it by itself. And Jean Wan Half uh, and company have a proof that there are no strength-like operators in this model, so there's no way to move a single excitation by itself. On the other hand, if I take a bound state of two of these, so two of these, these can move in a plane just by a string operator. So I can just collapse the membrane and that becomes a string operator and these can be moved. But they can only move in a plane 
And so these are what we call planons or dipole excitations in the system. I can also ask about the uh, violation of the other term in the model, the A term in the model, and those create excitations that are localized at the vertices instead of on the cubes. And it turns out that these excitations can only move along lines. So I can create this configuration where I have two charges of these two vertices, and then you ask, is it possible for me to turn? If you try to do that, you end up leaving an excitation on, on the corner. So these are one-dimensional excitations. They're only mobile along lines. So that's the phenomenology of this, this X cube model. We have excitations that can move on planes, that can't move at all, and that can move along lines. And it has a ground stage generacy that grows with system size. So this was sort of the first, uh, even though historically has code came first, this is the model that a lot of people uh, paid attention to because it was easier to understand essentially. Um, but it distilled sort of the, the strange features of these fractal models. Okay. And then, so that was what we call that, that, that story. That, um, code. Um, I suppose it's a ground state position as here. Ha ha ha, cubic code. Not the, the one you just talked about. Yes, it does. Yeah. It, so this has a ground state degeneracy that's due to the. So that was what we call type one models. They're also so called type two models. So these are models where actually you have no excitations, topological excitations that are immobile. So all excitations in the system um, that cannot be created locally are just stuck, completely stuck. Um, and the reason for that is that excitations in these kinds of models are created not at the ends of membrane operators, but fractal operators. So in 3 plus 1D, you can imagine a Spinsky tetrahedron, for example, as shown here, and the excitations come at the edges, at the corners of the Spinsky tetrahedron. And so if you want to move these, there's no way to do so. Uh, these systems. So I won't worry about the details of this, but this is this is the, like, one of the codes that uh, jean Pierre wrote down, which has this behavior. So again, it is an exactly solvable model, which is why we know it has all of these properties and it can be studied. Uh, and I should say the ground state degeneracy of Haas code is even stranger than the one that I wrote down here. It behaves non-monotonically. So as you change system size, it doesn't behave in any nice way. So there are a number of different kinds of types of fracton models. It's a very coarse sort of uh, taxonomy. There's these type one models, type two models. People uh, have considered so-called type 1.5 models where you have fractal operators in planes, but they can move in the third dimension. There are these panoptic type models, which have loop-like excitations reminiscent of 3D topological order and also fracton excitations. And so there's, there's just a number of models uh, going around in the literature. And then there are as many perspectives on these models as there are models themselves. So people have tried to approach this fracton problem from a number of different angles. And for each of these ways of thinking, there's always an exception. So this X cube model, for example, is the simplest one. It can be understood by all of these different approaches, but they're generalizations of the X cube, such as sort of a non-abelian X cube, for instance, where some of the techniques people have for understanding X cube don't work for the non-abelian system, or some of the ways of understanding X cube don't work for the for Um So we wanted to understand, uh, is there some general framework for thinking about fractons in which all these different models can fit. And maybe that will give us a starting point to address classification of these models. Okay. And you wanted to use familiar tools from TQFT because that's what we understand. So let's start from TQFT and let's see if we can uh, explain fracton order. So before I go to that, let me pause and see if there's any questions at this point. No, and I'll continue. And let me review uh, the, the 2D Toric code quickly. Okay, so the Toric code Hamiltonian, it's a two plus one D system. You have links on the, uh, on the, on the edges of the square lattice. Um, you have two terms in the Hamiltonian. There's the plaquette term and the star term. The ground state as before is just the plus one eigenvalue of each operator in the Hamiltonian. And then you can create excitations. Excitations in this model come in four flavors. There's the identity, there's the charge, which is the violation of the vertex term. There's the plaquette uh, flux, which is a violation of the plaquette term. And then there's the bound state of the two, which is the epsilon. And these satisfy braiding and fusion. So for instance, the, the flux 
uh, and we charge in the Doric code upgrade non trivially. So there's a minus one sign. If I imagine create a, creating a single flux excitation, uh, sorry. So if I start in the ground state and create two separated charge excitations, for example, and I create two well separated flux excitations, I can apply an operator that will upgrade this flux around the charge. And when you do this, you'll pick up a minus sign, essentially, because a sigma x and a sigma z will cross once. And so these have uh, non trivial rating statistics in this model. You can also show that the this, this epsilon particle, despite being a bound state of two bosons, E and M are bosons, is a fermion. So epsilon is a fermion. So that's the dark code. Any questions here? Because this will be important in my construction. Okay, so four types of excitation from the dark code. And now we can consider invertible defects in the dark code. So here, here's one defect that I can consider. This is a spatial defect. So I can imagine terminating my system on the uh, on my left, for example, where I don't close it. So this is a boundary. This is not meant to continue up to infinity. This is a boundary. So this so the starter, for example, uh, sorry, the, the plaquette term uh, in, in the Doric code next to the boundary has to be modified. And that's what I mean by a defect. A defect in, in a gapped Hamiltonian, I can add terms to the Hamiltonian. I can even add degrees of freedom to the Hamiltonian. What I'm not allowed to do is close the gap. So I can add any terms that don't close the gap. So I'll say in the same phrase. So in this case, I'm just changing the terms next to this boundary. I just remove a link from the plaquette term. So in this case, what you can see is, now what you're allowed to do is, if I apply a single X operator, I can create a single charge. Right? In, the bulk, in the bulk, I can only create charges in pairs. And the reason for that is that um, in the Doric code, if you take a product over all vertex terms with periodic boundary conditions, this is equal to one, and the product over all plaquette operators is also equal to the identity. So this tells you that fluxes must come in pairs and charges must come in pairs in the bulk. But as soon as I introduce a boundary, I can now create a charge locally on the, on, the, uh, on the boundary. And so this tells me that on the boundary, the charge is identified with the vacuum center. This is what we in condensed matter would call condensation. Right? On the boundary, I have a condensate of these charges. It's identified with the vacuum center. And so this gives me a different set of anions on the boundary. In the bulk, I have my E, M, 1, and epsilon. But on the boundary, 1 and E behave the same because E can be created locally. And then M and epsilon also behave the same because they only differ by E. So I've changed uh, uh, my topological order, in a sense, on the boundary. I have different excitations localized there. You can also consider the other kind of bound boundary where instead of modifying the plaquette term, I modify the, uh, the star term on the boundary. And in this, uh, um, <clears throat> in this case, I can locally create a flux excitation on the boundary. So I'm identifying the flux with, with the vacuum sector. And the boundary anions in this case are just one and the charge because M has been identified uh, again with the vacuum. And so E and epsilon also get identified. Excuse me. Could you remind me, in each of these uh, star and plaquette terms, they're all commuting? All of them commute. Yeah. And the reason is that there are always two of them that overlap. There's no way they just get one of them overlapping. Mm -hmm. And these constraints are sort of trivial. They just follow from sigma x squared being one. That's right. Yeah. And right, th it, this would only be true on the periodic boundary conditions, right. of course. So those are two kinds of different invertible defects in the Doric code. There's another defect, which is called a twist or a dislocation defect, in which case I just remove all the... Yeah. Why is this an invertible defect, the, the boundaries? Uh, because I can stack two of them together and cancel them out. Stack two boundaries? So I could imagine... Um, let's see. You mean you, you could put it together in this system with an idea? Going to go to the two boundaries. That's right. Make a trivial. That's right. Yeah. Right. So, and there's also this twist defect where I just take out all the spins from this defect line, and then I have to modify it again as before. I have to modify the terms in my Hamiltonian locally along this defect, 
And so this is one way of doing it. Um, I won't go through the details, but this is an anion permitting boundary. So in this case, if I start with a D particle on one side of the defect, I move it through and it turns into an M. So this is an anion uh, permitting boundary. So one goes to one, E goes to M, M goes to E, and epsilon stays the same because it's a bound state. And again, this is an again this is an invertible defect because if I took two copies of that, right? I take an E, it turns into an M, and then I do it again. I cancel that out. E goes back to E. So this is an invertible. Defect. And you can actually show in this case that these defects in the Tora code obey the fusion rules for icing and ions. So it can be a bit more general. I won't go into details, but. Uh, in two plus one, the topological order is described by uh, unitary modular denser categories. So some category C, for example, that I have in the bulk. I start with this theory, and then I imagine condensing some set of anions, which I'll call A. And so this is describing a gap boundary between the topological order that I started with. I condense some anions, by which I mean I trivialize them. They're now in the vacuum sector of my theory. And the gap boundary is described by the set of anions I've been there. So there's a one to one correspondence between anion condensation and gap boundaries in 2 plus 1D topological orders. And the same way we can also understand 1 plus 1D defects into the topological order. So there's a so called folding trick. If I have a, a defect line in the middle, I can imagine folding the system onto itself. And I again end up with the gap boundary to vacuum in that case. So uh, in 2 plus 1D, again, we have a general description. So given some category C, there's a, there's a bunch of constraints on what kinds of anion condensations are allowed. This goes under the name of commutative uh, Frobenius algebras. So as an example, if you take untwisted 2 plus 1D digraph Wittens with some gauge group G, the set of all gap boundaries that are consistent with the bulk topological order are sub, some subgroup K of the group that you have and then two cycles. So in this case, we can label all the distinct gap boundaries that you're allowed to have. If you work through this for G equals E2, which is the right code, you'll find two different gap boundaries, which are the ones that I showed you. So is that, so any questions at this point? Okay, so we want to use this framework of anion condensation and gap boundaries to start building fracton models. Let me give you a simple example of that. So let's say I have two copies of Z2 gauge theory. So I have these charges, keys, which carry the, uh, the different labels, just you know, the two copies. And then you have these flux tubes, which you can grow and contract in this case of this. You have E and M for each copy. And now I'm in three plus one D, so instead of having uh, the M particles be spinning charges, these are flux tubes in 3D. Then E and M break down trivially. So imagine the following defect between two copies of Z2 gauge theory. Okay. On this defect plane, I'll condense um, bound states of two E particles from the two different gauge theories. So E1 and E2 together are condensed. And simultaneously, M1 and M2 together are condensed. Whoa. By condensed, I mean it's identified with the vacuum or it can be created locally, right? So on the defect plane, I can create E1 and E2 together and then separate them. Equivalently, this means if I take an E1, it just goes through the defect layer and turns into an E2. So it's a transparent boundary. And the same thing happens for the flux tubes. So to make particles with restricted mobility, this is a bad choice. This is not what I should be doing. But I can consider a different uh, surface defect, which is where I condense flux tubes on the defect uh, plane. So M1 is condensed. Vectorially, it means that flux tubes are allowed to end on this defect plane. Same for the other one. And because E braids on trivially with M, the Wilson line that would uh, create uh, the E1, E2 pair on the two sides is confined. And so in this case, I'm not allowed to take an E1 particle and move it through anymore. This is sort of the starting point to start getting tracked on. I've constrained the mobility of my excitation by what, by what I'm uh, condensing on the plane. And there are also these uh, 1D defects that one can consider. These choices are just choices of boundary condition on the defects for the theory, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And those correspond to different choices of anion condensation. So a general picture for a defect EQFD is as follows. I have some defect data, um, which is 
heuristically, you have some bulk three plus one B topological order, which it tells you that there are certain choices, consistent choices that you can put on the two plus one B defect. That in turn induces a different set of choices that you could put on lower dimensional defects and so on and so forth. And so you end up with a bunch of maps between these different uh, defect data in different uh, dimensions of the system. So more pictorially, um, what you're doing is you pick some surface here, you choose some set of bulk excitations that can uh, condense on this defect. And so there are some choices that are mandated to you just by the fact that you started by a DQFD and you want to keep the bulk gap open at all points. And then the non-trivial statistics between uh, your bulk excitations and what you're condensing on the boundary gives you the mobility restrictions in this case. So here's uh, sort of a, a picture of what you're doing. So I started with three plus uh, one D topological order, and I'll start stratifying space into lower dimensional uh, surfaces. So I introduce a planar defect. I can introduce another planar defect. Then I can do it in the other direction. These two will intersect on the one D defect, and I can make some choices there. And so this leads to topological defect networks. So we have a three plus one D topological order in the three strata. These mean that planes, which we call two strata. There's some boundary conditions we can make there, some set of anions that can be condensed. These two strata may meet in one strata, so four of them meet at one, and there's some choices we can make, make there. And typically, this is enough to specify the system, the zero defect is usually specified for you fully. And so this gives you three different length scales in the problem. There's the length of my entire system, there's the length of each three strata, and then there's the microscopic length scale, uh, small a. And you want to be working in a limit where the full system, yeah, sorry, yeah. We do it in an anisotropic way. Wait. So we keep everything isotropic. Yeah. If, if you allow yourself to be anisotropic, the number of choices you can make just grows completely out of hand, and there's no way to make that. Uh, makes sense of it. Yeah, so far we're going to keep full uh, lattice translations on the tree. Yeah, and also keep rotations on the tree. What did they bring in your description of that? I found space was breaking the translation rotations. Uh, we'll keep a lattice rotations of so discrete rotations. Yeah, full rotation will be broken, but we'll keep discrete rotations. So that's the rough idea. So what we want to do is we want to, the first thing you want to make sure is that we can reproduce all different known fractal models using this defect network picture, which we can do. The next thing one might want to do is to come up with new models, right? This is only good if we can come up with new models. And the long-term goal, of course, is to use what we know about PQFTs and gap boundaries of PQFTs to constrain the possible fractal orders and hopefully come up with a classification of fractal orders. So this is sort of the input data that we're using. We have some three plus one topological order in the three strata. This fixes the bulk excitations of the theory. We pick some gap boundary between those. This is responsible for uh, lower, lowering the particle mobility. And the local excitation structure is set by the 1D defects. In all the cases that we consider the 0D defect is just trivial. Okay, so mm -hmm. by gap boundary, do you mean actually boundary or interface? The defect in the same theory or is it a boundary condition? Good. So you can think of it as a gap boundary to vacuum of the double theory. Okay. Yeah. So you can always play a folding trick. And so you can just class it. So classifying defects between two different theories is the same as classifying. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. So the only inputs we take into topological defect networks are a three plus one D topological order, a choice of stratification, and then what Compensations we would make. And so, in, in a sense, it's a systematic way to construct different fractal models. Okay. So, let me not bother with the conjecture and just get it. When you say you're describing a higher category, three categories. I'm oh, sorry? Mathematically, it would be accurate to say that your topological defect network is just a three category or some higher category. Yes, but it's not clear. What the, the full algebraic structure of these defect networks is not clear. Yeah. For instance, we know that we know how to label gap boundaries between, let's say, three plus one D diagram written and, and, and the vacuum. Um, but what's not known is what the classification is of the one D 
defects between different two D defects, for instance. This has not been fully classified yet. It's some bimodule or a bimodule, but yeah, we don't know. This data is not known. Yeah. So here's a simple defect network, a, a trivial defect network. Let me take a stack of two D dollar codes. That's it. And of course, in this case, trivially, the excitations can only move the planes. I got plane ops for three because there's no coupling between the layers. So if there's an M anion sitting in this layer, it can only move in this layer. It's not allowed to dump through. The non triviality comes when you couple these together. So let's build a defect network for this for the X cube model that I mentioned before. So here's a bad choice for a boundary condition on the two strata. If I have two copies of Z2 gauge theory again, and I condense bound states of the E particles, so E1, E2, and M1, M2, those can just tumble through. So I haven't lowered the particle mobility, and so this is a bad choice for building a fractal model. On the other hand, if I condense just M1 flux loop tubes uh, separately on, on, on either side of the defect, that braids non trivially with the E particle, this lowers the mobility of my E charges. So those are now my, once I've made this choice of the gap boundary, E particle in one cube is not allowed to move to the other cube. So I'll lower this mobility. Is it a bad versus good? Is the distinction between invertible and non invertible? It's still invertible defect. It's still invertible. It's invertible in both cases. Here, bad and good, I just mean do I want a fracton model or do I want a DQFD? If I make the earlier choice, I just get back to uh, 3D as uh, E2Gage theory. But if I make the other choice, I get a fracton model. Okay, so that's the choice we make on the two strata. Here's the choice one that we should make on the one strata. So on the 1D defect between four Z2 gauge theory, so there's four cubes of Z2 gauge theory that are meeting on planes. I've already made a choice on the planes. Now I have to fix the boundary condition on the 1D defect. So in this case, what we'll pick is that flux cubes from neighboring, so an M1, M2 together are condensed on this, um, on this defect and then so on and so forth for all the others because I wanted isotropic. So all pairs are condensed in this case. And then quadruples of the charges are condensed on the one strata. So four E particles are equivalent to the vacuum on the one D defect, which means locally I can create four of them. So if I take four different E charges and these are labeled just by their uh, what, what cube they live in, and I bring those together to the back to the one D defect, they're equal to the vacuum. This is exactly what I want for my fracton model. So if I take one of them and I bring it through the defect, it'll split into three. This is exactly the mobility of the X cube model. So now if I build a network of, this, of these defects, I end up with particle mobility that's equivalent to the mobility of the X cube model. So this is how we go about building by the X cube model. You can also show that if, you, if I take two of these together, so bound states in the X cube model were able to move within planes. So again, you reproduce that. Two charges can go through the 1D defect and turn into two on the other layers. And so they're allowed to move in this case. And then the flux sector is responsible for the uh, 1D particles, the particles that can only move along lines in this case. But I won't go through that. There's a set of moves one can do to show that a 1D defects can, can move only in lines in this case. Those come from the flux sector. So in, in this case, through this choice of gap boundaries, we're able to reproduce the mobility of the X cube model. In this case, we can actually do even better. We have a local gap Hamiltonian we can write down, and we have a unitary circuit that we can apply to it to literally get back to the X cube model. So we know our defect is giving us the correct, the correct model. So this is what the Hamiltonian looks like in case you're interested. We also have a defect network for a type two model, which is how it's decode. Go through that. And I think I'm running out of uh, time. How much time? Ten minutes. Oh, okay, great. So let me go through and let me stop for a second and take some questions and then continue. So could you also change the bike theories in these cubes, right? I mean, you can take effect between different bike theories. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, you can do lots of things there. There's a lot of freedom here. Yeah. But I think to start with, one wants to do the simplest. Uh, thing, which is just take, you know, the same. So in order to reproduce sort of the models that are already in the literature, all of those have the same bulk 3D theory, essentially, in, uh, in each cube. And we're not really considering a different one. Yeah. But in, in, in principle, you could make something completely anisotropic and 
gamma. And how do you decide which of the boundary conditions sort of preserve the gap and which don't? Uh, so that's um, at least for gap boundaries between two different 3D topological orders. The set of allowed gap boundaries is equivalent to the set of uh, allowed anion condensations. And those are one-to-one -one correspondence and the latter is being classified. So for example, for... Um, I mean, if you if you're just given a three D, just you know, forget about all these four that have been told. Mm -hmm. Could you see it there? Indeed, you can you can you can uh, at least for higher output and gauge theory in three D, the set of allowed boundary conditions that keep your uh, theory gapped are known. So they're just labeled by a subgroup of your gauge theory and three go cycles in that case. But I in, indeed, in general, it's not known what the general. Uh, Allowed gap boundary conditions are in, in three plus one D. In two plus one D, they're completely not. But for three D, we don't know. So that, that is one problem to the problem of classifying fractals. First, we have to classify gap boundaries at three D. Okay. Um, so all of this sort of reproduces models that we already know, but now I just want to go through an example where we build a new fractal model where the fractals are non-abelian. Why is this interesting? Well, people want to build topological quantum computers, and we need non abelian expectations for that. I should also mention one reason that fractons are exciting is that typically we think in three plus one, the um, point like excitations don't have any non trivial braiding between each other. But if you lower their particle mobility, then you can get non trivial braiding for point like excitations, even in 3D. And so fracton models are actually a way to get non abelian charges. Uh, or excitations in a 3D system, which may be useful for quantum computation. So now I want to build a non abelian fracton model starting from D4 gauge theory uh, in 3D. So just a quick review here's a group. It has uh, five conjugacy classes, it has five ARAPs. The character table is here. The point like charges are labeled by, by the ARAPs of D4, and the loop like excitations are labeled by the conjugacy classes. And the charge, non trivial uh, braiding between the charge and the loop, is, is given by the, uh, by the character table. So the one that I want to point out is the non trivial braiding between the sigma charge and the S squared flux. So the sigma charge in this theory and the S squared flux braid non trivially. And this is what I want to use to build a model where the sigma charges become fractons. And there are some fusion rules of the theory. If I want to make the sigma particle into a fracton, it only braids non trivially from the character table with the S squared flux. So I have to use that to make, to, try, to make the model. And using sort of intuition that we built from the XQ model, I want to condense these S squared fluxes in such a way that I lower the mobility of the sigma charges. So now in each three strata, we have G gauge theory, so D4 gauge theory. Let me draw. As before, the first thing we want to do is make a choice. On the student's trial, so we want to pick some gap boundary here that will lower the acceptability of my expectations. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I can think of this as. I, this is the uh, the defect between two D four case theories is the same as a defect between D four squared and vacuum, just by folding trick. The ball is three plus one. This is three plus one. Right. So this is two dimensional. This is three dimensional. Yeah. So I have cubes of D four case theory, and then I'm making a gap boundary between those. And for uh, G gauge theory, we know what all the labels are for these gap boundaries. So it's just some um, group and then go cycles, three go cycles, which is uh, written on the slide. So in this case, we pick uh, this particular subgroup that I've written. And essentially, what it does, it condenses the S squared membranes individually from the two different uh, three strata. And then on the one strata, again, we need to make some subgroup in this case, which is also written on the slides, which will condense four of the sigma particles together, which is what I want. I want those to turn into fractals. 
And you're lucky in this case, the zero strata, this point like defect between eight cubes doesn't give us anything non trivial. Okay, so, pictorially, this is what it looks like. We have the four gauge theory. And then on the two strata, we condense the S squared fluxes from the two neighboring. So, S plus, plus and minus, just stable, uh, plus and minus, for example, the two different gauge theories. Um, and then uh, the different bound states of the fluxes are condensed. And then bound states of the charges. So, the IJ of the different charges, those are also condensed. So, the IJ, the abelian charges are free to move. The abelian fluxes are free to move so far. But the sigma charges cannot move because they break non trivially the S squared. And then on the one strata, the choice that we make essentially means that four sigma charges are equivalent in condensed to the vacuum sector on the one strata, and then balance states of the charges are free to move. In any case, I won't bore you with all the details of this. Through this construction, we can make non abelian fractons. And we get uh, abelian excitations, which are flux, which are fluxes. We get abelian charges, and we get non-abelian fractals in this model. So the defect network picture lets us, the way we understand it now, we know how to make certain choices if we want to make certain excitations of the three D gauge theory into fractals. What we don't understand, which we don't have a full understanding of, is what choices lead to what, what do to what, which kinds of phases, right? So given a three D gauge theory. What kinds of condensations do I have to do with the boundaries to get back to a 3D QFT? And what kind of choices do I have to make to get a fractal model? Right? And what are the consistency conditions of this? Because algebraic structures is, is hard for me to be understood. And in each case that we've analyzed, we, 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 have a, we have an explicit lattice Hamiltonian, which is nice because then we can just go ahead and analyze this. But this model or they always end up being exactly solvable. And so we can figure out bringing and fusion rules for the system. So these defect networks in some sense are a way to say that fracton models are not quite as beyond TQFT as we want. They're really TQFTs with defects in them, right? We're still starting from a TQFT. That's a language that we understand. And then we just need to understand how to think about defects in TQFTs, and that'll lead us to fracton models. You, you reproduced the, the type that had a fractal. Yes. Something special about that? Uh, No, it's just that in that case, we just have in each cube, we end up having Z2 squared gauge theory. And that's just a strange kind of choice that we have to make to reproduce the mobility, but we know how to do that. Maybe Wilbur can say more. He's thought about uh, making general data networks for stabilizing groups. Okay, so I'll just stop here with the summary. Uh, so we know how to construct all gap fractal models using defect networks. We can come up with new models. Um, and the nice thing about this picture is that we can use all the tools from TQFT. So there's a language at least that we understand. That's a good starting point instead of just groping around in the dark. Um, and hopefully we can use some of these tools. What is Boolean? That's Boolean type one. No, even type two. Can you make house code? We can make house code. Yeah. But I think Wilbur's made house code. He made house B code. So B code is what? So if you start with A code and do this entanglement RG, it splits into A code and B code. So we were able to make B code, but since this work, uh, Wilbur and collaborators have, for example, shown how to make even A code. Um, so any stabilizer code actually can be written as a defect network. Um, we also know how to do chiral models for So there's a lot of work that still remains to be done. We don't understand how to classify these different gap boundaries. We don't understand how to what choices lead to what different kind of phases. And so um, hopefully that's something we can make some progress on in the next few years. <laughs> so uh, there are also like gapless fractal models, right? Indeed. I cannot resist to ask, can you say that if you have to start with a CFT and conform more defects, Construct those. I haven't thought about that. I don't want. Yeah, I won't comment on that. I won't speculate. Uh, but it'd be good. We should discuss that. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, it, it, uh, so if there's an experimentalist that will be very good at engineering stuff, uh -huh. you can make one of these things now. Give a prescription for how to make these things. 
in the lab. I think the, the challenge to that would be that we have to start with a 3B double ion water and even finding, you know, two dimensional get spin liquids experimentally has been a very difficult uh, thing. But indeed, if if somebody came and said, here's a material, this has 3D Z gauge theory as its low energy back to the field theory, then we would know what to do with that. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, but even 2D double logical order has been very difficult, has been very difficult to find experimentally uh, in materials. Uh, I think the best hope is in these digital quantum simulators. Are you saying this once you have the 2D this particular topological order, then, then there would be a description. That's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or even in, uh, I think in these NISC devices, for example, or these uh, quantum simulators. Yeah. So there are some yeah. people who are yeah. working on making the X cube, yeah. for example. Yeah, they're kind of imagine that you could do it. Right. In, in materials, I think it's very difficult. Yeah. Even, even doing a topological order has not been found. I think it's, it's that's, a, that's a hard challenge. Yeah. We, we need the material, but also a way to make boundary conditions for it, right? It's like right. a C2 gauge theory, but also impose those. Yeah, those can be done energetically, for example. Oh, so okay. There are ways to do that, right? So the, in, in terms of the Hamiltonian language, if you want to impose condensation, there are ways to do it by just adding terms to the Hamiltonian. And that's the second part. So you can do that just by applying the theorems. Is the defect description necessarily any simpler than the original models, for example? If you it's not clear that. <laughs> good, no, that's a good question. So, for the X cube and the simple models, for instance, the defect network doesn't give you anything new. But one of the challenges in the fractal landscape has been they're limited to very few kinds of models. Uh, so, for instance, there's just a hand, unlike the Kitai form double modern string nets, right, where you can just put in any category and you get some data for your anions. There's nothing like that for fractons. So getting non-abelian fractons, this is sort of one of the simplest ways to do it. I don't really know any other ways to do it. Uh, and so if you wanted to limit yourself to the known models, indeed, this description doesn't help you. But if you want to know what is the most general set of allowed fracton models, this lets you get new types of models that you can't get otherwise. So if you just take X cube and you try to get some non-abelian fracton from it, yeah, it, it won't work. People spend you know a handful of years trying to do that. Uh, you think there are models that cannot be obtained that way? So uh, the only counterexample that I'm aware of is this infinite layer churn Simons theory that Shea and company came up with. Um, it's not obvious to us how that fits fits into these defect networks, but there's something very non-local about those models. So, and we, we are here, we are imposing locality very strongly. So all local models, we know how to do the defect network. Uh, but indeed, this, this infinite chart Simon's kind of thing is the one model that I know doesn't really fit into our But I'm not convinced that that model is even gapped. So I, I, I don't know. Is example of the chart so that, that example, does it have lattice positions? Yeah, it, it, is, it is isotropic, but it has a weird property where, uh, for example, it, it's a layered kind of system, but it has this property where anions up here gray non-trivially with anions down here. So there's some very non-local interaction between them. Yeah. And I don't know how one would get something like that in the defect network, which are very, very local. <laughs> it's all the constraints are yeah. So that that evades our description. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Thanks, the speaker once again.